It's 3.15 a.m. The front page of a newspaper filtered across the road, carelessly blown in the breeze. The sky was black and moonless, and the two men who crept across the street far below casted shadows thrown only by the flickering, blue-green neon of a nearby sign. These two were the sole people on the street at this time, and they glanced this way and that before hiding themselves in the alcove of their target's entrance. The building, the cyber cafe. The cyber cafe was an old, disused wreck. It went by the name of the banquet back when it was open, God knows when. It was a curious name for an internet cafe, but there was probably some long forgotten reason behind it. The place had no visible security besides a simple metal grate across the window and a rusted old padlock on the door. It was chosen as the night's target by the two men because of the building's age and its potential for high value stock left abandoned inside. Come on, Axel, get it open, is the man with the shading of red stubble across his lower jaw. Raff was his name. Give me a goddamn second, man, his compatriot replied, grunting as he cracked the padlock at last with a crunch and a shower of rusted metal. A wire was inserted into the final lock, the one embedded in the door itself, and a minute later the men were in. With a long, low creak, the door was pushed inwards, and as they had predicted, no alarm bells were sounded. Raff grinned and rubbed his hands together, leading the way into the abandoned building. The place was thick with dust. Broken desk chairs lay heaped in the corners, and the desks themselves stood scattered clumsily across the entry room, as if they had been pushed to the side and just left there, no one ever bothering to return them to their original positions. A faded poster that hung on the wall advised its readers on the importance of staying safe online and featured an array of cartoon children in colorful outfits, all using computers. In the darkness and the gloom, however, these children appeared unsettling. Their eyes were just a little too wide, their smiles ingenuine, and none of the characters on the posters seemed to be looking at their computers. Every one of them stared out watching over the inhabitants of the room. And in that particular moment, the inhabitants were Axel and Raff. Both men shivered in discomfort, though neither admitted their reaction to one another. There's nothing good in here, bro, said Axel, running a finger across the surface of one of the empty desks and flicking away the grime. You just don't know good loot when you see it, Raff replied with a murmur. Check the cupboards for parts, anything metal. Circuit screens, we'll take the lot. Get them in the bag, and if there's more, we'll use the van. There's a couple of doors back there, Axel said with a nod, gesturing further back into the shadows of the cafe. Storage, probably. All right, I'll go and check it. Raff eased his way through the room and through one of the doors at the back, well away from the meager blue light that spilled in from the street. What he saw there surprised him. Jesus! Hey, Axel! Yeah. Come check it. Forget the parts, bro. We've hit the jackpot here. Axel followed on behind, and together the two men stepped into the room, awestruck. The second room was far longer than the first, and it was illuminated with a sole, quietly buzzing beam in the ceiling. The beam was once one of many, a dozen or more by the looks of it, but it was now the last light source remaining, and its brothers had long since gone dark. It revealed to the men the sickly blue-yellow patterns across the wall, like something straight out of the 90s. And it showcased the rows upon rows of computers, stretching away into the shadows before them. The computers were not particularly new. They didn't look like models from the past decade, but still, they were undamaged and would make decent stock. Very decent stock indeed. Just look at all this. Why the hell would these get left behind, do you think? Axel asked, his footsteps echoing as he moved deeper into the room. Who cares? They probably forgot all about them, Raff replied, scratching the stubble across his chin. This is great. How many can we grab then? We can fit a whole load into the van. More if we aren't too concerned about potential damage. We should try and keep them safe. They look in pretty good condition. Axel crouched down and rubbed his hands across one of the computers 
pressing and trying the buttons on the sides. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We can always come back again tomorrow. Or hell, later tonight if we're quick enough. Raph mused, but his train of thought was interrupted by a loud, sudden, high-pitched jingle. Like the gradual beeping sound of a power-up noise compressed into a single second, both men jumped back in surprise as the monitor Axel was playing with shined suddenly into life. Where once there was nothing but an old, dark screen, there was now a radiant blue background humming discordantly with the buzz of the overhead light. What the? Axel began, narrowing his eyes in uncertainty. He returned to the computer, tapped the screen with his finger a few times, making dull thunks against the glass. He gave the monitor a shake, and in response, an 8-bit image appeared upon the screen, accompanied by a quick error sound, like something you'd expect to hear on one of Windows's older systems. XP, maybe. Perhaps even 95. But the image in question was a very simple, pixelated smiley face. You know the kind. A circle, two soulless dots for eyes, and a long, inverted arch for a mouth, curved up along the cheeks. The smiley stared out at the men, and the men stared back. Heart beating fast, though not quite sure as to why, Raph spoke out first into the gloom. The hell is that? He murmured, barely above a whisper. Couldn't say, Axel replied in the same tone, eyes glued to the screen. Should we turn it off? Damn right we're gonna turn it off. It's giving me the creeps. Just press the power button. Please don't came a crackly, distorted voice from the speakers. The line of the smiley's mouth began to glitch and ripple. Raph felt the blood drain from his body, and his composure cracked as it cooled. His throat dried up and he found himself unable to speak. Axel stared between them. Did, did he just respond to you, Raph? He asked, his voice wavering. Raph struggled for a voice. It did, I swear it. I told you to turn it off, and the screen replied. Please. It said again, the speakers fizzing and crackling. Please don't. Raph wanted to turn tail and run, to get the hell out of there, but Axel stepped closer. Why not? He asked, hands clenched at his sides. The pixels of the smiley jumped and flickered, the monitor hummed, and the blue of its light reflected like water in the men's eyes. If you turn off the computer, I won't be able to invite you to the banquet. The banquet? Axel repeated. What? What banquet? You're both invited to the banquet. Please come and join us. There is plenty to go around, said the smiley. Raph reached out and grabbed the sleeve of his friend's jacket. Let's go, man, he muttered. Let's just get the hell out. Over to their left, another monitor flickered to life. That same rapid startup sound, that same blue screen, Another low hum to accompany the first, and then finally, another smiley. Glitching into life with the error noise, cutting through the room's tension like a sharpened blade. Help us, said the face. Help us. The smile flickered briefly to a frown, and then back. After a pause, it spoke on. Please, help us serve. There is so much to go around. We require your assistance. A third monitor burst into life way towards the back of the room. The startup sounds echoed between the walls and the voice was deep and low. Don't leave us alone down in the dark. A banquet is greater with guests. Greater with guests. Whispers a fourth smiley, and then a fifth. All around, the startup sounds became louder and louder, deafening almost, a cacophony of glitching, beeping errors. Greater with guests. The banquet is just downstairs. Greater with guests. And at last, the two men could take no more. Axel broke first, turning and making a break for the door. The spell over Raph was also snapped in this instant, and they barreled back through the open doorway and clattered and shoved their way through the main room, past the desks and back through the door and into the glare of the neon lights outside. They tore down the length of the street and clambered chaotically into their van, not bothering to take even a second to mask or to hide their presence there on that night. They drove, and they did not stop until they were miles and miles away. They contacted the authorities eventually. 
an unlikely turn of events for a pair in such a profession as they. But the police were called nonetheless, and the cyber cafe was duly explored. There were only two cops that went in at first, not really believing that they'd find anything. But that soon changed when they passed through the second door, when they ventured downstairs and discovered what lay beneath. What they found was a long, low table in a dark and blood-stained room, a table adorned with plate after plate of fetid, rotted food. And seated at this table, at regular intervals, were no less than two dozen corpses, chained to their chairs and connected to the walls with wires protruding unnaturally from bumps in the skin. And their faces were carved and ruined with the marks of the smiley. A circle cut around the edge, deep into the skin. Two deep, soulless dots for eyes, gaping holes, and a long, inverted arch through the mouth, curved up slick along the cheeks. Please, won't you join us? Story 2. Flytrap. It was dusk when I decided to use the internet cafe. The sun was low and the buildings of Tokyo were illuminated in shades of a rich, blood-like red. I only needed about 10 minutes. I only had one document to print. I suppose it could have waited until the next morning, but for my own peace of mind, I just wanted it done. I entered that particular lonely cafe right at the day's end. I was tired, stressed, and just wanted to go to bed, but duty called. I removed my glasses and rubbed away a smudge on the right-hand lens nodding politely to the man behind the desk towards the back of the room. I slid my glasses back up my nose as I slumped down into a chair, squinting at the screen before me and dropping my briefcase by my feet. Thudded a tall, softly glowing server tower at the side of the room. I glanced over at it. I wasn't sure what a lone server would be doing in the main computer room. I thought at first that it might just be an unusual decoration, a centerpiece. But no, the flashing red lights and the wires connecting the tower to the ceiling implied that it was in use. Whatever, I don't know much about computers. I'm sure it had a good reason for being there. It thudded again loudly, whirring and grinding. I glanced at my neighbor, well, relative neighbor at least. A man hunched over his computer at the end of my row, several desks away. He paid the server tower no mind, and so, I chose to do the same. I returned to my screen, navigating to the browser and then to my email, tapping away at the keys. The email site tried to buffer and then failed. I tried it a second time, but again, it failed to load. Irritated, I attempted the site for a third time and the screen simply froze on the buffering icon, a maddening red circle, slowly spinning around and around around and around. With a sigh, I opened another browser and tried again. I saw an interesting article pop up as I did so and found myself intrigued. Shooting a look down to the clock in the lower right corner of the screen, I decided I had a few minutes to spare. So I opened the article and began to read, passing the time and quickly losing myself to the interesting words. I clicked from this article to the next adjusting my collar and clearing my throat as the temperature began to rise. I returned to the email site and tried again. It loaded at last, though I was met with another frustrating buffer when I searched for the email in question, the one with all my documents. Hey, no matter, I just jumped back to the articles, reading and reading. And it's funny, at the time they were so fascinating, so engrossing, but right now, I couldn't tell you what a single one was even about. I don't remember a damn word. I felt myself beginning to sweat. I wiped a thin layer from my forehead and rubbed my palm against my pants before placing it back onto the mouse. Not particularly sanitary, but hey, perhaps the owner could consider investing in some air conditioning. The server tower over to my left glistened in the dim red light. Had it always been so gloomy in here? I looked over to it. It appeared slick and shiny too, just like myself. Then again, perhaps it was just a trick of the light. I tried the email again, inching closer and closer to my goal, 
splitting my attention between the site in question and the pages upon pages of tantalizing, curious content. Content that now eludes me, but I remember the feeling, the feeling of delving deeper and deeper, of learning, of discovering truths, truths long hidden away. I felt something stick to one of my fingers as I typed, still searching my glitching inbox for the documents. I didn't even look down at the keyboard. I just tried to flick the stickiness away before continuing. There it was again, something sticky connecting to my forefinger to one of the keys. I glanced down to see a smear of some unknown, disgusting liquid, and in revulsion I wiped it on a tissue in my pocket. This is revolting, I thought to myself, sweat beginning to leak from my back and into my shirt. I just need these things printed, and then I'm out of here. This is insane. My glasses were beginning to fog. I removed them to wipe down the lenses. My throat was also deathly dry. I don't quite know why it took me so long to realize, but it was at this moment that I became aware of just how wrong my surrounding atmosphere really was. The last time I removed my glasses, the light in the room wasn't quite so red. The shadows weren't quite so deep. And that humming, that background beat, that pounding, it wasn't quite so regular. Screw this, I thought to myself. I tore my attention away from the computer's tempting, crypting passages and articles. I tried the email site just one more time and searched for the docs, but the screen froze. Pixels appeared and disappeared at random. I looked down to the lower right-hand corner. I tried to lift my wrist and look at my watch. And by doing so, I realized two things in very quick succession. First, the timer on the computer was incorrect. Far more time had passed in actuality than the built-in computer's clock would suggest. And second, my hands were now connected to the keyboard. I considered this development with outright dismay. Long, red, wet strands of an unknown mucus connected my fingertips to the keys. The letters oozed and bulged with a thick, reddish gunk leaking out disturbingly from beneath the keys and across the keyboard. Ah! I cried out in alarm, panicking, trying to stand up, to pull myself free from the computer. But I found myself unable to do so. The same gunk across my hands had seeped to the chair and into my clothes, binding me to the seat. Ah! Hey! I called out to my neighbor, the man at the end of the row. What's happening? But the man did not respond. Hey, please! I called out to him, but the man sat motionless. I raised my hands with the keyboard attached and slammed them down in frustration. The man across from me tipped forwards ever so slightly. As he began to droop, his head turned to mine. And to my horror, I saw that he was entirely faceless. The man was a fake, a dummy dressed up in a suit and a wig. I stared at the dummy in a panic, and after a moment, he simply slumped to the floor, taking his chair with him, which was attached by a fleshy, reddish goo. I turned to the man behind the desk, the man who'd been standing in the shadow since the beginning. I looked at him, I really looked at him, and it became apparent that he too was a fake, a faceless, soulless dummy. I tried to spin around to look at the others in this humid, darkening room. The walls were damp, streaked with moisture. Wildly, I turned this way and that, staring at the others in the building. But all of them, all of them were fakes. I'd been sitting here this whole time with a group of non-entities. And that beating, that rhythmic pounding. My eyes fell upon the tower server, the lone server, right there against the slick, sticky wall a black beacon with thin, red beams glowing from the inside. With a sudden shout and a rush of force, I tore my hands from the keyboard and staggered up and out of the chair. It disconnected from my back with a wet pop. I still had one problem. My legs were still attached to the lower half of the chair. With all the strength I had left, I pushed the chair from my legs, losing much of the fabric of my clothes in the process. What the hell is this place? What is happening? I shouted out into the gloom but I was answered with nothing but that pounding of the server and a rumbling from the walls. I marched over to the server with wet footsteps. I had to know, I just had to know. And so with trembling hands, I reached up for a panel, hooked my fingers through the gap, and I tore it from the body of the tower. It fell from my grip, clattering off a nearby desk 
and landing with a sick wet slap against the ground. And behind the panel, illuminated in that soft, pulsating red, was nothing but leaking flesh. Intricate red tendrils coiled and throbbing. Black red ooze leaking down the plastic and the metal. And in the very center was a beating heart, bloated and blackened and overgrown, pounding and beating in its repetitive rhythm. I recoiled in terror, struggling to contain the contents of my stomach as I felt bile rise up and into my throat. I spun around on the spot, reaching down and grabbing my briefcase as I made my escape, hauling it from the floor with a grunt of effort, watching as spurts of blood and thick, dark, fleshy tendrils were snapped in the process. I could feel myself sinking deeper and deeper into the floor with every step. I reached out for the front door, painfully aware of the walls that were now hungrily closing in. The ever-present, growing rumble, and the fevered beating of the twisted heart sounded louder than ever. No! I screamed. Please! Using the last of my strength, I body slammed through the door, tumbling chaotically out and into the street, collapsing to my side. A man on a bike had to swerve to avoid me, and he swore as I landed with a painful thud. I groaned and shot a look back to the cafe, but there was nothing out of the ordinary to see. A closed sign hung on the front door. The window was pitch black and all the lights were off. No red, no moisture, just dark and empty. I awkwardly clambered to my feet. My clothes were ruined and my hands. My hands were stained with that thick red viscous fluid. I could hold it no longer. I vomited violently onto the sidewalk before turning and running, swearing never, ever to return. Story three, the web. I awoke to the sound of tapping. I blinked, my eyes blurry. I tried to focus on my surroundings. I'm still here, I realized quickly, glancing around through the dark. I'm still in the internet cafe. I leaned back in my chair, stretching my arms and rolling my shoulders, allowing myself a groan of discomfort. When I got here this evening, it was relatively busy. People were all around me, drinking their coffees and using the computers. Who in this day and age even needs to come to a place like this? I had wondered as I sat down for the first time. I don't own a computer myself, and my phone broke a few nights ago, so that's my excuse. I'd been using this place to send my emails. The World Wide Web, it's simply called. The words worldwide were in faded white neon lights with web in a soft, flickering neon green light. Not sure what the copyright is on such a name, but I guess that's neither here nor there. The place was shrouded in darkness when I awoke. There was no one there but me. The hell? I muttered quietly. Did they close up shop without even waking me? The desks and tables around me disappeared into the shadows and the gloom, giving the main room the eerie illusion of infinity, stretching out into the void in all directions. And there it was again, that tapping. It was ever so slightly, It was too loud to be coming from the computers, and yet, not loud enough for me to place its source. Hello? I called out into the gloom, but my voice was simply swallowed by the shadows. A shiver passed across me, and I decided that it was time to leave. I grabbed my belongings and stuffed them into my bag. I stood up, feeling the joints in my legs crack just a little. I'm getting old. I muttered to no one. I was about to make my way through the dark to the exit when the sound of the tapping caught my attention for a third time. I shot an anxious glance over my shoulder and paused at what I saw. A doorway, one I had not been previously aware of, perhaps because it was unassuming or not obvious in the daylight. But at that moment, whilst the world was dipped in darkness, the edges of this doorway glowed bright a soft, glowing green, and against my sense of better judgment, my curiosity was piqued. Should I? I thought to myself. I paused for a second to think. I'd clearly been shut in here by mistake and was unlikely to get such an opportunity as this one again. 
I'd take a quick peek through the doorway, just to see, and that would be that. I headed deeper into the building, towards the glowing green door. As I got closer, I started to feel vibrations through the floor. They grew more intense as I approached. I couldn't deny my anxiety, but there was excitement there too. After one final and very brief hesitation, I put my hand on the door and pushed it open, peering inside to take a look at its hidden secrets. Honestly, I expected a simple server room, one with glowing green lights or something, but this, this was not what I was prepared to see. It was a room far larger than the first, bathed in a dim green glow emanating from an enormous pile of clustered orbs in the room's center. They were piled up high above a collection of busted and broken tables. There were desks still intact in the room, each with their own computer atop it. The screens were switched on, all glowing green. I could have turned back here. I could have left this place behind, but I did not. Instead, I pushed forward. Unable to prevent the rush of curiosity, I stumbled forwards. I imagined telling my little brother all about this place. He loves mysterious and strange secret places. I weaved my way between the desks, pausing as the same tapping sound as before started up again. Was it coming from the keyboards? I wondered, casting my gaze across the computers all around me. But none of them stirred. Swallowing, I made my way to the base of the great cluster of orbs. Each orb was of such a size that I doubted I'd be able to carry more than one at a time if I were so inclined. I pressed a finger against the closest, shivering with discomfort at the white-green strands that pulled away from its surface as I retracted my hand. I wiped it on my jeans and took a step back. I reached into my pocket for my phone with the aim of taking a picture. And as I did so, my eye caught sight of a figure in the distance, a shadowed silhouette seated silently at one of the computers. I cried out in alarm, dropping the phone on the floor with a clatter. My heart pounded as I stared at this mystery inhabitant. Uh, hello? I called feebly, crouching carefully to grab my device. The sound of the tapping began again, fading in, then back out of focus. This was another chance for me to go. I could have fled back across the room and out through the doorway, but again, I did not. I approached the figure. What are you doing in here? I asked them my sense of sight adjusting gradually as the seated figure became clearer through the shadows. When at last they were visible, I froze at once, staring wide-eyed at the person before me. She was a woman. All the color was drained from her skin. She was sitting rigidly at the desk with her hands fixed on the keyboard. Are you, are you okay? I tried to ask, but my voice was hoarse and barely came out above a whisper. The woman did not reply. A quick glance to her fingers showed me they were not moving at all. The green glow from the screen reflected off the surface of her eyes. Bulged veins, frozen in place, stood out on her neck and across her arms. With my throat death dry, I reached out for her, my hands shaking. Can I help you? I whispered, and in response, her eyes flickered suddenly over to mine. I cried out in horror and surprise and stumbled backwards into a desk with a loud thud. The woman stared at me, perhaps unable to do anything else. Her eyes were wide and in them I saw only terror. I tried to make my escape. Scrambling away and crashing past the computers in my retreat, I passed by the great mountain of the pale green orbs and just as I was approaching the doorway, I stopped. Just one last time, one last fateful time. I listened to the sound of that relentless tapping. It was louder this time, much louder. Louder and directly above me. Slowly, I lifted my gaze to the shadows of the ceiling. And there in the darkness, my eyes met with eight, eight green eyes. A splash of white green saliva dripped from the creature's clicking, leaking fangs and onto my shirt. Struck with such a horror as I have never experienced before, I found myself unable to move. The nightmare on the ceiling above me, a great and monstrous spider scuttled into position. And down came its stinger, sharp and quick. It thrusted into the side of my chest, and before I could react, 
I felt a deep and overwhelming heat begin to rush through me. Colors danced before my eyes, and I felt my joints stiffening. I staggered into a nearby desk and put my hand on the chair for balance, easing myself down into it for fear of falling to the floor and being unable to cushion my fall. Please. I managed to force out as my jaw locked into place, the muscles all across my bones tightening in unison. Waves of pain and nausea flooded through me, but there was nothing I could do. I had my chance, and it slipped by me. The spider made a hissing noise, then across the ceiling it went, faster now. In the spider's excitement, it fell upon the woman. She was paralyzed and unable to fight back. And I, unable to look away, was forced to watch as she was devoured. I do not know how long she had been here. I do not know if there are others, but the monster is coming for me. That much is certain, and there is nothing I can do. I am barely able to type this message out on the computer in front of me. I am beginning to lose all feeling in my arms and legs. If you're receiving this message, I beg of you, please send help. It may be too late for me, but it could spare others. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.